Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to the Women in Heat session. Uh, there will be no twerking, just in case any of you wanted to go get a coffee. <laughs> <Too easy. laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm Diana Fleischman. I'm going to be chairing this session. This is Marty Hazelton, and we are in a sense, essentially academic sisters. We both have the same advisor. We were a few years apart. And uh, Marty is a um, pioneer in ovulatory cycles research. So she's been really interested in how ovulation and menstrual cycles and hormones influence women's behavior. And because of all of that, she has actually come under intense scrutiny and fire for <laughs> long sigh, uh, for, uh, for her research because of the various different ideas, philosophical ideas, about what it means to actually be influenced uh, by hormones. So in her recent book, Hormonal, she talks about all of this different research on hormone cycles, on ovulation, and all the research that's been done, including things about pre pregnancy, breastfeeding, menopause, birth control, et cetera. And uh, we're gonna have a conversation about that now. Please welcome Marty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me as well. I look forward to this. Okay. Um, so in your book, Hormonal, you talk about hormonal intelligence and wisdom passed down through this kind of maternal line. Mm -hmm. And usually when people call a woman hormonal, they mean it as a slur against women and their rationality. And in the book, you're kind of trying to take back the word hormonal right. as intending to mean a kind of hormonal intelligence, a special kind of intelligence. So what do you mean by hormonal and hormonal intelligence right. in, in hormonal? Yes. So... Um, I, so I've been studying this topic, how women's hormones affect their social behavior and in their sexuality in particular. I've been doing this for about 15 years, maybe even longer than that. Um, and one of the things that we discovered is that there's evidence for what I view as intricate psychological design that's been shaped over millennia that has guided our female ancestors through many challenges of life from initiating their reproductive cycles, becoming fertile uh, after, at, upon puberty, um, to finding a mate, at least initially, uh, to having offspring, to raising those offspring to reproductive maturity, and then transitioning into another life phase where their tasks differ yet again. Um, and so in seeing these things and seeing how women's hormones really guide them through these incredible challenges, very different roles that they occupy throughout their lives, and thinking about it in an ancestral context in which uh, our lives were not quite as cushy as they are now. So um, the extra calories required to maintain a pregnancy, a huge challenge for a woman. So our hormones were orchestrating our body systems in a way that helped, to, helped us to address these really tough adaptive problems that we encountered throughout our lifespan. So that was what I saw in my research. And um, rather than thinking about our hormones as kind of mucking up the system, as causing um, chaos or irrationality, I saw evidence for special and intricate design shaped by evolution. So that just seemed fundamentally wrong to me to think that our hormones make us crazy. Yeah. So that's one thing. And the other thing, which maybe we will come to later, is what we can do with the intelligence that we have, now that we've learned a little bit more about how our hormones are nudging us, how we can exploit that information. So can we use the intelligence, the scientific intelligence, cluing us in about what some of these things are that our hormones might potentially be able to do for us and exploiting them to the extent, maximum extent possible to meet our modern day goals, which might or might not be consistent with the things that um, evolution shaped our bodies really to do um, for an these ancestral challenges concerning reproduction. So uh, Marty and I are both evolutionary psychologists and evolutionary psychologists look at human behavior and the human mind through the, ends of, uh, the lens of evolution. So the idea is, why would our minds be the way that they are as shaped by our evolutionary history? So some things have a functional design, and that is one thing that you have definitely looked at, is the functional design mm. of the human mind, and especially women's minds, yes. in light of the different obligations that they had in terms of finding a mate, uh, taking care of offspring, right. and, and other kinds of things like that. So 
do you think that modern women, and how do you think modern women should be more in touch with their sort of evolved hormonal intelligence? Um, well, I, in general, my, my general philosophy about scientific knowledge is that more is better, and that if we want to engineer our lives given the, um, the kinds of things that are the biological nudges, just to take a, a, a key example here, um, if, if we want to understand how to um, enable our bodies to meet our modern day goals, then we better have more information as opposed to less. And so um, there, I've gotten a lot of pushback by suggesting that women's behaviors uh, are influenced by their hormones, because to say such a thing would seem to undermine women's ability to sort of think through things if we're being you know, nudged around by our hormones or controlled by our hormones, which I think is definitely too strong of a term, then maybe we're not fully in control of our lives ourselves. And I think that that is just, I think that, and so by documenting that, are we undermining women? Are we sending the wrong message? And I think that's exactly wrong. I think instead, by understanding these phenomena, we are better informed um, captains of our ship. Um, so, you know, we are, in, we have all of these capacities, and if we don't understand them, then we can't really use them. And moreover, the things that we might feel drawn toward that we might feel like, ah, oh, I don't know, I'm feeling a little bit funny about my mate, for example. Does that mean it's time to end the relationship? Well, um, some information about why we might be dissatisfied with our mate and whether that is really consistent with what might have been a challenge for our ancestral humans, but it's not so much for a, ch a challenge for us, might make us say, well, I know what that is, and I'm going to disregard that. I'm not going to let that nudge make me think that there's something fundamentally wrong with this relationship. I totally, Does that make sense, uh, Diana? I totally, it's, a, it's amazing to me how an evolutionary perspective has given me insight into my thoughts and right. feelings and helped me figure out when to be skeptical, when to be accepting, and actually to not just follow my feelings blindly, mm -hmm. right. but, but to, to try to have a deeper understanding of having my rationality and my sort of evolved psychology which is mostly unconscious, yes. really play better together. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. And so yeah. I think that if we make some of the unconscious rationale a little bit more available to us, then we'd know better what to do with that. So, you know, a slice of chocolate cake might sound great for breakfast, but do we really think that that's a good idea? Um, in the same way that, you know, we might feel attracted to a particular person, but is that really a good idea? Well, I think we need more information, right? So we know what the chocolate cake does, it's gonna taste good in the moment, maybe the long-term consequences aren't so hot. We might think about the same thing with respect to other things that we are um, attracted to in the moment. And if we understand the logic behind those attractions, then we can decide what to do with them. Absolutely, yeah. So. In the, you, you actually trade off and you talk a little bit about how it's acceptable to talk about hormonal influences on men, potentially, and it's somewhat, or a lot less reasonable, and you talk about a variety of different scandals. Mm. There was a study done that said uh, in the election of Obama, right. women who were ovulating and married uh, tended to have a different attitude towards the two candidates, mm -hmm. for example, and there was a lot of outrage about that as well. So what do you think about is the difference between saying that there are hormonal influences on men versus right. women. Why do people have such a problem with saying that there's hormonal influences on women? I think that, um, it's, a, it's a good question. I think that um, a lot of people would prefer um, that women just kind of fall in line, right? I mean, maybe we prefer that men fall in line too. But I think there's more of a historical precedent for that. So women falling in line and doing as others would like them to do, whether that's family members or a male partner um, or some other structural entity of some sort. Um, and, and if women's desires are changing, um, and if in particular their sexual desires are changing, then that's a threat for a number of reasons. So one is that they're harder to track now, so she might change her mind. Oh my God, what are we gonna do about that? Um, men change their minds too, of course, but this is, I'm saying that this is kind of the reputation that women get and that it is in conflict with these standards that people might have for a variety of, of reasons. So, so that seems challenging that these desires change, but that also, 
um, the claim that a part of female sexuality might be tied to the cycle and might resemble some things that are happening in our non-human animal cousins that are run contrary to sort of the good girl stereotype of women. So if sexuality in particular is changing <coughs> and is somewhat difficult to track, that sounds threatening to people in certain kinds of positions, um, in, to, in a position where um, they want a female partner, but they want her to um, sort of be a guaranteed presence and not to be uh, in interested in straying away, then, then that's really threatening. So I think that's part of it. Yeah. Um, I think that, that there's also um, just the notion, a stereotype that men are more rational than women are. Um, and who knows exactly what all contributes to that, but given that, um, anything that would um, suggest that there are variations that are somewhat difficult to understand would be consistent with that stereotype that women are less rational than men. And so people are not going to like that. I don't particularly, I don't like the implication that women are less rational, and I think that it's wrong, actually, but even if it weren't wrong, I wouldn't like it. Um, that wouldn't stop me from doing my science the way that I do it. Um, and I would certainly want to know. I would certainly want to have that bit of intelligence so that it informed my decision making. Yeah, absolutely. I think people do have a, some difficulty connecting humans to non-human animals. There's been research that tried to say that humans are uncomfortable with being reminded um, that they are animals. Right. I, I always remember a very funny, my, my aunt when I was a kid, when she was used to see the gynecologist, she'd say, I'm going to go see my animal doctor. <laughs> and nice, I like <laughs> that. My veterinarian. And so it's very interesting to me that people have some discomfort with these animal ideas when it seems to betray their rationality, right. but also people call upon mm. animal metaphors and analogies right. in terms of uh, strength. Yeah, so and, we have a, a tenuous relationship with And this. physicality, mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. Uh, so you've often dubbed yourself as a Darwinian feminist. I think one problem that people have with this idea that women are influenced by their hormones mm. and have these pervasive hormonal influences, not just throughout the, the cycle, but these epochs, you know, mm. through puberty, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. through their fertile years right. and mm -hmm. pregnancy and, and menopause, is because feminism has been talking about men and women as having equality, and it, this seems to sort of take away from that, the idea that women are more animal because sure. they have these kinds of hormonal influences. Yeah. So you've talked about, in the book, being a Darwinian feminist. So what is a Darwinian feminist and how does it agree and disagree with more mainstream yeah. kinds of stripes well, of feminism? Well, number one, I start with not denying that there are biological sex differences. Bottom line, I, mean, I just don't think that this has been helpful um, to women and women have made huge strides, no doubt. Um, and I am along for the ride and glad to be a participant. Um, but I don't think that, um, so, but, but saying that men and women are equal and that there are no biological differences between men and women, I don't think is particularly helpful um, because it's wrong. Um, and the more we know, then the better off we are, as I have argued. Um, did I, did I answer your question, Diana? So yeah, other ways that Darwinian feminism right. might, might differ from sort sure. of more mainstream Right, kinds right, of so, so starting definitely with the, an understanding of our biology and a respect for the evolutionary biology. So um, I think that um, even if it weren't particularly practically helpful, I think that we have a right to understand absolutely everything about our bodies and our minds, including the selection forces that shaped them over evolutionary time. So I don't think we need to stick with a narrative that says that it's all a social construction, the differences between men and women, um, in order to create the same opportunities for women that there are for men, um, or to, you know, give women the same compensation for the same kinds of work that men do. Um, but also recognize that, that the motivations of men and women might actually differ, and there might be a biological foundation to that. And if a woman chooses to pursue something that is, on average, more female typical than male typical, then that's just fine. Um, and so a woman shouldn't have to occupy a man's world. Um, a man should actually, you know, just as much be occupying a woman's world in terms of these on average differences. Um, so that's, a, that's the form of feminism that I'm really talking about, is just understanding that there is this diversity across the gender spectrum um, and um, not 
letting that be the thing that, um, not, not erasing that, not trying to erase that being the critical element of enabling men and women to do the things that they want to do with their lives and not creating artificial impediments or not judging men and women differently um, when they might engage in the same behavior, which is also a very tricky thing, right? Like sexual promiscuity, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and promiscuity, we talked about this uh, yesterday in, in my session with Claire Lehman and, and Jeff Sparrow, which was we're talking about how uh, people now are more likely to say that premarital sex is okay. People yeah. are tend to be more pro-sex mm -hmm. uh, than they ever used to be. And there's a lot of shifts that have happened in terms of uh, man and woman uh, dynamics. People talk a lot about how young people are having less sex than mm -hmm. ever, and about how men and women might not be understanding each other in some ways that cause problems. Right. So in the earlier session about Lost Boys, there was this profound idea that there is misogynists, people who are uh, excluded from potentially uh, women uh, to date women or be in relationships with women for whatever reason. And mm. there, men and women sort of misunderstanding each other. And I know as evolutionary psychologists, we have a lot of ways that we think about how men and women misunderstand one another. And those are not necessarily always maladaptive reasons. There are mm -hmm. adaptive reasons why men and women misunderstand each other. So what are some ways that evolutionary psychology can inform? Because you just said that the beautiful thing about uh, a man should also be living in a woman's world. A man should be understanding women and, yeah, right. and their, their cyclical effects and their hormonal intelligence as well. Uh, right. How do you think that men and women can better understand each other? What's one of some of your favorite examples of these disconnects? Oh, gosh. I don't know if I've got great examples, but, but I, I, one thing that I think can happen in relationships between a man and a woman is if a woman is trying to understand a man's base. So, a lot of things that happen in relationships, whether they're friendships or mating-related relationships or parent-child offspring, uh, parent-offspring um, relationships, is that we make a lot of assumptions about what somebody's behavior might mean about their true intentions. And if we don't ask, then usually, I mean, we're often wrong. But I see this happen in particular when we use our own mind to think, okay, well, if I did that, what would that mean? Um, about interpreting somebody else's behavior. And that will si be systematically wrong if you are on average different from the person that you're, whose behavior you're trying to interpret. And so you're using your own mind as sort of the default model of what the other person's mind might be thinking when they engage in a particular behavior, and you'll get it wrong a fair, not fair amount of the time. You know, and it goes in the other direction, you know, as well. You know, so if men are using their own minds, then they're going to find sometimes, um, or perhaps more often than if they weren't doing that, um, a woman's behavior mysterious. Um, so I think that there's some accommodation by both men and women to understanding what the on average levels might be of our motivations, our desires, the things that we think are particularly important in life, the things that are important for us to do with our time. If we understand those on average differences, then we can make an adjustment. Of course, then we have to calibrate for all of the differences between people. Um, so even if there are on average differences between men and women, there's still gonna be overlap and there will be a man who is, um, who is below the female mean. So he'll be, you know, very more female typical, perhaps, than male typical. And you'll see the reverse as well. And so we have to make some individual adjustments as well. But I think that, that if we are starting with the wrong target on average, then we're going to be subject to some of these miscommunications. One aspect of, of evolutionary psychology that I think is really important in one area of research that you worked on is something called sexual overperception bias, right. which seems so important for people to know about in this particular moment for right. people to understand how men and women yeah. misunderstand each other sometimes strategically. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about sexual sure. perception bias and what it might mean in terms of this, this current mm -hmm. climate that we're living in? Yeah, so I wrote about this. This was actually, um, this was actually part of my dissertation research. And so, and the paper is, is coming up on 20 years old now, which is stunning to Amazing, me. Yeah. Um, but what we, what we documented and what had been documented by other researchers as well was that if a man and woman are encountering the same scenario, so maybe they're viewing a photograph of a man and a woman smiling at one another, and this is all um, sort of 
uh, framed in heterosexual mating interaction terms, but we could certainly explore the other possibilities as well. But this is what we initially where we began was by thinking about heterosexual mating relationships. Um, you show a man and a woman a picture of a man and a woman who are smiling and engaging in some sort of a friendly interaction, and you say to the man, well, what does it mean? How interested is she in him? And you ask a woman the same question, how interested is she in him? Then the man and the woman are going to give you different answers. Um, so the man is going to say, well, I don't know, that looks a little flirtatious to me, whereas the woman might say, she's just being nice. Um, and this has been documented now, of, you know, lots of different methodologies. It's been documented in um, some of the most gender equal um, cultures in the world in Northern Europe. Um, so the, it's, it appears to be a real phenomenon that we've actually gotten some pushback on this. It's been a little bit controversial. I, this <laughs> I, Diane is laughing because I say that as if, it, it, it is a surprise to me every time I walk into one of these controversies. But in any case, it's been a little bit controversial. Again, probably because the common denominator is sex differences. But um, it's been a little and bit sex, sex and differences sex, and sex, sex. And Why sex don't you just pile on so, something you know, else? <laughs> right. And we'll add in a little bit of political um, upheaval by me calling it Darwinian feminism. Um, so, um, so why do men? This, why do right, men overperceive so the sexual do this? interest? Yeah. The idea was that that men could ancestrally. So think about this in terms of reproduction being the bottom line from an evolutionary perspective, and men and women interacting ancestrally. So if a man is trying to interpret a woman's behavior and judge whether she might be interested in having sex or not, he could make two different kinds of mistakes. He could overestimate her sexual interest and be wrong and maybe get slapped in the face, or he could underestimate her sexual interest, which means a potential missed opportunity. The reproductive consequences of those two kinds of errors, a slap in the face, I mean, maybe that's embarrassing, maybe that does have some downstream consequences for mating, but it's more of like an in the moment kind of thing, whereas a missed up reproductive opportunity, that could doom an individual's genes to oblivion. Um, you know, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, and so the, the reproductive consequence is vastly different of the two types of errors, and so men might err on the side of a little bit of optimism in this particular arena. Dan Savage likes to call this dickful thinking. Dickful thinking. I had not heard that before. That's lovely. So, yeah, the idea absolutely is, as Marty said, is that, yeah, men, the missed opportunity is a much bigger uh, cost. And I find this is a very helpful thing to talk about with men and women mm. in that I don't think that it's, it's some kind of cultural phenomenon or, or patriarchy that men are over-perceiving the signals of women's interests. It's totally natural for a man to think that the barista at the coffee shop is smiling at him, is interested in him, uh, even though it's not, it's not a rational, mm -hmm. you know, obviously that's her sure. job to smile at you right. and to get you coffee and to take your money, right? And so this is the very difficult thing about it. And I think when men find this out, uh, it causes a couple things. One time, it, it does give them a bit of an existential crisis, like, oh no, all this time I've been thinking all these women are interested in me and they're not. Uh, but on the other hand, it can help people just be much more honest, mm -hmm. where you say, I, I, I think you might be interested in me. You're smiling a lot. And she's like, mm, my face is stuck this way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being nice. Um, so speaking of sex, one thing that's very unusual. So in your book, you talk about something called concealed estrus. And you also talk right. about the kind of beautiful Greek story mm. of you know where the word uh, estrus sure. comes from. Right. So talk a little bit about what estrus is, and why human women are different than almost all other human, I mean, human, non-human animals. Yeah, um, okay. Well, so um, ovulation is revealed in many species. So if you watch the Discovery Channel, you've no doubt seen the sexual swellings that characterize some of our non-human primate cousins. So baboons and chimpanzees, their, um, their genital area becomes swollen and often very colorful. The males find this totally exciting and interesting. To us, it looks quite, quite strange. But the point is that, that fertility is marked within the cycle. When the female is about to ovulate, her bottom swells up in this way. So no wonder the males are interested in this, right? This is how one, the males get their genes into the next generation by taking these reproductive opportunities seriously by being attracted to those women and doing what they can to compete for their affections. 
Um, so in, and ubiquitous across mammalian species are also scent cues. So female hamsters, not very friendly to male hamsters, except when they are in estrus. So that's right before ovulation and the day of ovulation. When they can become pregnant, they change their mind about male hamsters. Um, you also said their, their vaginas are only open for like well, a few and hours, that's true right? Too. That is also true. It would but solve a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They grow. I mean, they, female hamsters, so they're super aggressive with males. And when ethologists, the people who are studying animal behavior, when they describe the females, they have like specific technical names for the ways in which the females are abusive toward the males. So there's a rolling and biting fight. You can use your imagination to see what that would be like. But not when females are in estrus. They will leave their, leave their burrows and leave a fragrant scent trail for males to follow. The males will follow them and come into their burrows, and they will mate, and everybody's happy. When she's no longer in estrus, though, she'll beat him up. So, um, so <laughs> people who own uh, um, pet stores know that they don't request the male and the female hamsters to be shipped together. Um, that's just generally good recipe not recipe for not dead male hamsters. Idea. Yeah, right. So scent cues ubiquitous throughout the animal kingdom. Um, what about humans? So clearly, our bottoms don't really swell up, at least not on a cyclical basis, the way that they do in chimpanzees. Um, you know, but might there be other things that change across the cycle? And um, even if it wasn't to our female ancestors' advantage to reveal where they are in their cycle, and I actually think that there's a reason why they don't, that, or at least many possibilities, but I think that there are good, those are good possibilities for why females would not sort of show their cards um, and, cards. and, let, them, and let, the, let the males know just exactly what's, what's going on, what their strategies might be like. Um, but that doesn't, so, so that, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that female bodies do that they're not able to totally control or conceal that males wouldn't be able to then pick up on. And so there would have been a lot of what we call in evolutionary psychology selection pressure and evolutionary biology more general, generally. A lot of pressure on a psychological system for mating and for attraction that would be sensitive to cues of fertility within the cycle. So anything, even if it is extremely subtle, that changes in a female's body that might emit some sort of a signature that a male perceptual system could pick up on, you expect males to pick up on those cues and to find them sexually attractive. So what about what's going on in humans? Um, one of the first things we did was to ask about women's motivation and how women's motivations as they change across the cycle um, perhaps coinciding with fertility within the cycle, maybe with sexuality is turned on in some way. If that is true, then you expect to see that in, in terms of, ask, in terms of um, changes in women's desires and their attractions, but also potentially changes in how women are presenting themselves. If so if they're going out to compete for the best possible mate, perhaps, on those few fertile days of the cycle, then that's going to have a behavioral signature that a male or even a fe another female could pick up on. Um, so we took photographs of women at high and low fertility. They were reporting to my lab for se sexuality research. But we were interested in whether they wore different kinds of clothing at those, on those high and low fertility sessions of their ovulation cycle. They didn't know anything about what we were actually up to. We were just bringing them in multiple times throughout the month. But we photographed them at high and low fertility, and we found that women wore, wore, tended to wear, on average, just a little bit more attractive clothing on fertile as compared with non-fertile days of the cycle. So there were some behavioral signatures. We also did some work to check out the scent possibility. And that actually is one of the most robust things that we see in humans, is that there are changes in women's body odors across the cycle. Men find women's body odors when we sample them at high fertility, and we've done this um, on the torso. Uh, other, people, <laughs> other people have, have collected vaginal odors, but we didn't, we stayed north of the wall. The <laughs> we stayed north of the belt um, and, and collected underarm body scents because hormones have actions throughout the body, and so it's possible that we could be able to pick up on hormone changes in somebody else's body scent, regardless of whether those scents are collected. Um, so we collected underarm body, um, uh, underarm samples from women at high and low fertility, and men rate the high fertility body odor samples as more attractive. Absolutely. Yeah, so one interesting thing is that, that the human women have sex all the time 
throughout their cycle. Mm -hmm. And there's a variety of reasons why women might do this. Non-human animals, they really only have sex in order to reproduce, but it seems like in humans, sex isn't just for making babies, that sex is used for a variety of right. purposes. Yeah, so humans will have sex any time. But Not, mostly on the weekends. Mostly, yes, but mostly <laughs> on the weekends. Yeah, that's the most robust change. So there are changes across the ovulation cycle, but the weekend effect, that is really clear. Friday and Saturday night, it's, it's time for... Um, that's Marx's one contribution to <laughs> sex research. Um, so, uh, but I don't think I'm answering your question. No, so, so I'm, my, my question really is why are women... Uh, oh, I mean, right, why are we engaging this? in sex throughout um, our fertile... Uh, yeah. Throughout the, th the fertile period and then afterwards. So we engage in sex during all kinds of non-fertile periods. So pre-puberty, uh, pre sort of at the adolescence, as adolescent exploration period before fertility is really um, geared up and, and um, whether before females are really ready to reproduce, there's some sexual activity there. Um, during the, during uh, the course of an ovulation cycle, there might be a little bit more sexual activity on high fertility days of the cycle, but there's a lot of sexual activity outside of that window, and even during um, menstruation, when, when um, fertility is extremely low, um, and we know that sort of, you know, cognitive, you know, Intellectually, we know this, um, but our, our bodies presumably are picking up on cues as well that tell us that fertility is low. But people have sex during those periods. We have sex when we are pregnant. We have sex in the postpartum period. We have sex after fertility cycles have ceased altogether. So what is going on here? What's going on with this? One possibility is that sex serves, as, uh, serves a function of getting people together in a social partnership in order to raise offspring together. Um, perhaps it provides some assurance to males that they are, in fact, the fathers of any offspring that are produced as part of a male-female partnership. So if you're having regular sex with your partner, um, it serves as somewhat of a reassurance that any offspring that she might produce, it's not perfect reassurance, but it serves as some reassurance that, that any offspring she might produce would be your own. So. Um, in addition to just feeling close and connected to a partner and marking that relationship as a thing for yourselves, the two people involved in the relationship, and potentially for others as well, and producing some um, of the social structure that's necessary for a co-parenting relationship, um, but, but also uh, that there is this pot potential for paternity assurance. Um, certainly, we know that sexual activity has its own hormonal effects, and so once that is in place, we might engage in sexual activity in order to reinforce that and to produce a pair bond. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. There's another very sexy ape called the bonobo. They used to be called uh, pygmy chimpanzees. They're smaller than regular chimpanzees, and they have sex all the time, uh, males and males, females and females usually, and one idea is that they actually maintain a matriarchy through sex because there's this reward system built upon sex, sex feels good, then you can actually use sex mm. to affiliate sure. and to bond, right? So there's a, a lot of ways to get someone to like you. You can give them a cookie or you can give them an orgasm. There's lots of different ways to, uh, to, to bond. And so one idea is that these bonobos actually maintain a matriarchy because the females all engage sexually with each other with a form of sex called GG rubbing, and that means that they take their, their genitals and they bounce them against each other, usually for only a few seconds. So one has an apple, the other one wants it. They, they negotiate that exchange uh, with it's sex. It's very, very cooperative. It's very, it's, it's very sweet. I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> it's not particularly appealing for us, but for them it's, it's great. And an interesting thing is that if you have two or three or four groups of bonobos, you can actually just open up all the gates and let them flood in and meet each other. Whereas if you did that with chimps, they would kill each other. There would right. be all it those kinds of violence. Uh, but with bonobos, there's a different kind of frenzy that ensues when you just introduce them all to one another very quickly. So speaking of sex, you actually talk a lot about hyposexual desire, which mm. is this kind of medicalized term for when women don't want to have sex uh, compared to, compared to uh, men. And, and you say that, you know, obviously, there's Viagra for men. It's actually quite a simple solution mm -hmm. for men to uh, have desire because it's so so well connected right. to their genitals, yeah. right? But uh, this this drug with this really terrible name 
called flabanserin. I so think if sexy. you were trying to nominate like the least <laughs> sexy word in the world, it sounds like, I don't know, um, it <laughs> sounds like dancing with flippers. <laughs> then why is it that there is no, you know, so first of all, do you agree or disagree with the kind of medicalization of female desire as some feminists have disagreed with? Mm -hmm. And also, yeah. you know, why isn't there a female Viagra? Right. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to treat those as separate issues. So um, I'd say that low, low sexual desire is a problem if you feel it's a problem, right? And so I don't think that a woman feeling like she wants to have sex rarely, if ever, should be a med treated as a medical problem unless she comes to her doctor and she says, this is a problem for me. I feel like I'm missing out on this important part of life or it's really hard for my, my partner and myself. Um, then, I, then I think it does become a problem, and to the extent it's connected to aspects of our biology, we can think of that as a medical problem. Um, you know, to the extent that we have reproductive goals and it's interfering with those, then we can think about that as a reproductive problem as well, or, or a medical problem, rather, as well. So um, I don't think that men and women, that, uh, you know, it's, it is a separate question whether we think it would be a desirable thing for men and women to be exactly equal, um, or for all people, for that matter, to be exactly equal in their um, preference for how much sexual activity they'd like to have. Um, I, but I, you know, I think that, there's, that, that, that is its own question, and there are values that, that are independent from scientific inquiry that, inf that inform how we think about that. I personally think that, that you know, we should respect the diversity that comes from our um, inclinations, wherever those inclinations come from, as long as they're not harmful to others, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so I don't have a, I, I'm not saying that I think that women who want sex less frequently than others have a medical problem. However, if they do want to have more sex and they feel that that is a problem, then we ought to be able to help them with that. And it probably has hormonal foundations to some extent. Now, um, men's problems in the bedroom, they were more tied to a mechanical issue, whereas women's problems in the bedroom are tied to a desire issue for the most part. And those might be more, those might be, the desire problem might be a very, very much a harder problem to solve. It might be more complicated, whereas a mechanical problem, they kind of figured that out. They kind of got that, they got that settled. Um, but it was settled in such a way that it was just definitive. And now there was this treatment that was available to men for their most cited bedroom problem, assuming that getting into the bedroom, that problem is solved. <laughs> Um, but their most common bedroom problem we solved with medical science. So why haven't we done better with the female problem? Maybe it's a harder problem, but maybe we just have fallen, we've lagged behind in understanding how women's hormones affect important things like their sexuality. And the, one of the reasons for that, um, I can see multiple, but one of the key reasons for that is that females have been left out of biomedical research, whether we're looking at humans or rats. Um, they've been left out of biomedical research because of their messy hormone cycle. So the very thing that might be the linchpin here that might actually help us understand some of these problems um, is the reason why females were excluded in the first place. So female rats, they were running in their wheels more, oh my God, on fertile days of the cycle. We can't have that. That is going to be noise in our experimental design. We can't have the females messing up the experimental design. We want everything perfectly controlled and stable. And those females with their unstable form, uh, hormone cycles, we can't have that. So we set them aside. And we just assume that the males will be a reasonable model for how we can think about the um, important biochemistry that affects these various kinds of phenomena or the various problems that we want to solve. But that's wrong. We know that that's wrong. Um, we got it very wrong with respect to women and heart disease. Heart disease has a very different trajectory for females as compared with human males. Um, and if we take male treatment as our understanding for female treatment, we're going to get it wrong. Um, so women don't tend to have the same kinds of warning signs that men do before they go into a full-blown heart attack. Um, their heart disease progresses at a different rate and, and at different, with different milestones over the course of their lifetimes. So we now know that that is a problem. We can't use males as a default. We know that all the way down to phenomena that occur at the cellular level. So that's being addressed to some extent, but we have a lot 
of lag to make up for um, in order to get our knowledge to um, the same state that we have our knowledge located at for men, uh, for, or for males more generally. Um, so I think that, that exclusion, systematic exclusion of females is, is one of the key problems. I think also not wanting to acknowledge the important effects of hormones, to think that, oh, well, no, for humans, humans have been emancipated from hormonal control. Thank God we don't have our hormones dictating our behaviors. Um, okay, um, so we're not quite like hamsters. Um, we don't have, you know, we are a little kinder to males more often than the hamster females are. So we're not quite like hamsters, um, but does that mean that, um, you know, is, does, that, does that mean that hormones are not important? Of course it doesn't mean that hormones are important. It just looks a little bit different in the human case. Um, but I think that we need to fully understand that in order to be able to and in order to have all of the information that might ultimately lead us to a better drug than flibanserin. So flibanserin, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's something that women have to take every day. Um, it is to ostensibly to treat low desire, something that women have to take every day. Um, they cannot drink alcohol That's while the they're using <laughs> this drug. So forget the you know wine and roses as the as the start of the romantic encounter. Um, and it makes them dizzy and pass out. So, um, so it's it's really it's and what really. Was it? What was it? What was? How many more sexual? Oh, and then it oh, and then it doesn't like and it doesn't even work. more sexual encounters a month. I mean, I know what point six work. sexual encounters looks like. Point but. six. <laughs> yeah. So you so you might have sex one more time per month if you're using this this drug. Yeah. So there was a. a significant difference in one sample and not in another. They started marketing to women. It's just really uh, terrible. And then also that, yeah, of course, not being able to drink is, is, is crazy. But I think that the control group that they should have done, you know, what happens all the time, actually, is that they should have said, have you tried having sex with somebody other than your main partner? <laughs> Do you want to have sex with somebody else? OK, then your sexual desire is fine. You're just bored of the person that you're with currently. And people just don't appreciate you know, I know that Marty did an amazing debate with Christopher Ryan, um, who wrote uh, Sex at Dawn, and he's this guy who advocates polyamory. I think he advocates it on sort of shaky evolutionary ground. But sexual boredom is something that humans experience, and it's an indicator that monogamy, you know, we would love to have sex with each other for 80 years if monogamy lifelong was really in our, right. in our deep ancestral past. So what do you hmm. think about monogamy and this kind of sexual desire problem. Oh, gosh. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, one, a, an important question for a woman who feels like her sexual desire is broken is to ask, well, is it really? Um, and, and perhaps it's not. But, yeah, but that doesn't, but even if, it's, even if it is something that's happening with the partner, she might want to keep that relationship she might want to preserve that relationship and not necessarily explore her alternatives sexually. So what can we do to help her nonetheless? Um, and, and I think that you know, if, if there is some sort of um, an intervention that's useful, then, then we should definitely make that available to women who want to pursue that path. But I do think it's, it's an interesting question. And, and um, one of the things that, one of the key things that we found early on in our research was that women's desires changed across the cycle. Okay, and so that seems pretty straightforward. If it's um, most possible for you to become pregnant on those few fertile days of the cycle, then wouldn't sexuality be turned on in general, maybe, but, but, or at least that you become sensitive to, to certain kinds of partners or interested in certain kinds of partners who would have been good reproductive partners, good partners with whom to produce offspring. Um, so, but one of the things that we found early on was um, that, that women's sexual desire was increased, but it was partner specific. And in particular, they became, so the variations across the cycle, they tended to say, oh yeah, I'm most interested in my own partner. These were women who were in heterosexual romantic relationships. But what changed across the cycle was that they became a little bit more interested in men other than their partner at high fertility. And so what was going on with that? One of the things that we saw, and we've seen this repeatedly, is that women who have more sexually attractive partners um, don't show that pattern. It's the women who have less sexually attractive partners. So it's as if sexuality is turned on, but in particular, a premium um, 
women start to place a premium on sexually attractive traits in a mate. Um, and so given that, and given that, that you know, our attraction to their, our partners might stay stable, but we might experience these other variations, then yeah, I think that part of the issue could be a question of who the partner is. I'm not, I'm not recommending that as a strategy necessarily. You know, people are going to decide whether that I, would work I've, for them I've or not. I've heard some anecdata about that, you know, where people definitely say, I had sex with somebody else, and then I realized that I still have a libido, and it wasn't lost somewhere. That's right. right. Um, so, <laughs> as you guys can see, there's a number behind me, and you can text in any questions. We have a a lot of questions actually in already. Uh, one recurring theme is that people really want to know more about hormonal contraceptives mm. and how mm -hmm. that might be influencing our evolved psychology. Right. So anything that you think is really important kind of take home message right. about that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, all of the work that I've talked to you about so far and more um, is looks at women who are not using hormonal contraceptives. So hormonal contraceptives tend to work by basically flattening out hormonal variations across the cycle. And of course, if we're seeing changes across the cycle, we think that those are hormone mediated. And so by flattening out those changes across the cycle, we'll also be flattening out any of those changes in, for example, women's attraction attractions to other men, um, or their display of ovulation cues, so those body odor changes across the cycle, just to give one example. Um, and if you are taking those away or flattening them out, what are the implications of that? Um, some people might find the implications to be quite welcome. So if you don't experience that little uptick in attraction to somebody other than your partner, that might be a good thing. Um, but other people might think that, well, that, no, I kind of want to ride the waves of my hormones. I want to feel those differences. I want to get that little extra boost of feeling confident in myself, which is something that we've seen in our work, that women feel better about themselves. They feel like they, they are more attractive um, on fertile as compared with less fertile days of the cycle. Um, and they might be assertive in some important ways as well. Um, so do we, do, you know, with, you could present women with this question, you know, do you want to take that away or do you want to have that present? And some women don't want it. They don't want anything to do with that variation across the cycle and they definitely, and they want to eliminate PMS while they're at it. Yeah. And they find that to be very helpful. It's something we haven't gotten into at all, um, premenstrual whereas, syndrome. Yeah. yeah, whereas other women are, are, are concerned about it. I don't think, so um, uh, there have been alarmist articles written about taking away this ovulatory phenomenon, what are the implications of that for understanding mate choice? So are, is, there, is women's mate choice psychology then broken by the fact that they're using the pill? I would say it kind of depends. Um, but long-term mate choice, who you would choose as a long-term partner, there's not good reason to believe that that would change by using the, part, by using the pill. Because women's long-term partner preferences aren't the things that change. What they are physically attracted to, that does change. Um, and what they find most sexually appealing, that does change across those days in the cycle. But we usually evaluate mates for multiple days of the cycle before we choose them as a long-term mate. So I don't think long-term mate choice is broken. There's been some hype about that, and I think that that's wrong. And we've actually seen evidence from my lab that, that confirms that that's probably wrong. Um, but the truth is that we just don't know that much about what the psychological impact is of using the pill. We know about the physical impacts. We know that using the pill Various formulations of pills won't increase women's um, cancer risk for various cancers. So we know those kinds of things. Um, drug companies have also been interested in reducing some of the nuisance side effects like weight gain and some other things that women have complained about. And so they've, that's been on their radar. But understanding the psychological consequences, understanding whether you feel, you know, these changes in feeling how bonded you are to your partner across the cycle, does that have an impact? We know very little about that. The only, and the other thing that I would say that I think is really important here is that different pill formulations um, have different hormonal impacts. So some pill formulations include both estrogen and progesterone. So you're putting estrogen and progesterone, you're introducing those at particular levels in women's bodies. Um, some will be just progesterone. And estrogen and progesterone have uh, different psychological effects. So estrogen is what is 
probably steering around a lot of our sexual desire, whereas progesterone is doing other things for us socially and might actually be more related to pursuit of um, long-term relationships and shoring up the bonds with, rela with uh, relationship partners. So the kind of pill that a woman might take should have different relationship implications. And we know so little about that right now. Right now, that, that is mostly a provocative suggestion. But could we enter a time at some point in the future where women would actually have this conversation with their doctors and say, well, I understand that this more estrus-like pill that mimics more of like what I might be experiencing at high fertility within my cycle might have these kinds of psychological consequences, whereas this more extended sexuality, non-conceptive sexuality phase, um, which is going to be more linked toward progest uh, to progesterone, which is not at its highest level. Um, it's actually fairly low um, when women are going through this peak fertility phase of their cycle. So progesterone should actually steer us more toward potentially that extended sexuality, bonded kind of sexuality that we have with a long-term partner. All speculation, but it sounds really important to me if we're trying to sort out whether taking the pill is a good decision for us personally and just providing women with the kind of information that they need in order to make those judgments, then I think we just need to demand a lot more. Absolutely, yeah. So somebody here, and I think this is a common criticism, so it's important to talk about, mm -hmm. has talked about evolutionary psychology being unfalsifiable or that things mm. can fit anything. Mm -hmm. And you and I are very sick of dealing with this, but mm -hmm. um, falsifiability basically is the idea that if you predict something specific enough for a theory, then that means that you can get evidence to contradict it, which then disproves your theory. That's falsifiability. And evolutionary psychology is evolving. Mm -hmm. There is always evidence coming in, and there are very much cherished hypotheses that are now by the wayside. So tell me about something that you've changed your mind about right. in terms of evolutionary psychology, in your own work mm -hmm. or generally mm -hmm. in, in the last 20 years that you um, hmm. think is a really good example of the falsifiability of evolutionary psychology. Right, well, okay. So the, this falsifiability qu question, I think we have to locate it, we have to locate what it is that somebody is wanting to support or falsify. So is it the general endeavor that evolution has shaped our species and because it's shaped our bodies, it has therefore shaped our minds? I think we're past that. And so there being, you know, like trying to falsify that, there's just so much evidence that only makes sense from that perspective that I don't, I don't think that we're looking for the, you know, one evolutionary hypothesis that shows that, guess what evolution did affect our species? I think we're past that. Um, now, when it comes to a particular hypothesis for a phenomenon of interest. So the fact that we have much more subtle ovulation cues, for example. Um, variety of possibilities to explain that. Um, you know, one I mentioned already, and that is the um, idea that, um, or I, at least I alluded to it, and that the idea is that um, by keeping that information to yourself in some way, or keeping that concealed within your body, it gives women a, a potential strategic advantage. So why would they become more interested in men other than their long-term partner at high fertility? Perhaps because those might be better reproductive partners, at least in some evolutionary circumstances. Maybe not in the modern world, maybe in the modern world, maybe not in the modern world. Um, so if we, um, so, but there, so there are a variety of different alternative hypotheses for why we might have concealed ovulation. Each one of those comes with predictions that can be shot down, and, we will, and then we will get rid of that hypothesis when that is the case. So I think that any hypothesis has to be testable. And if we locate our ideas at that level, then this question about whether evolutionary psychology is falsifiable or not, it becomes a bit nonsensical. So I guess I'd push back a little bit on that. Yeah. I think we're past that. Um, now there are a variety of hypotheses in this general research area with, which have been articulated, and some of them um, are different takes on the same phenomenon, different explanations for why something might occur. Um, so with respect to women placing, apparently placing a premium on sexually attractive traits in a male, one idea was that, well, women might just be going for uh, masculine features, and in particular, 
uh, there was an interest in whether women might go for more masculine faces at, on high fertility as compared with low fertility days of the cycle, and that that might be related to immune function, and therefore, if you choose the more masculine-faced male, perhaps he has better immunity because he's got higher testosterone, that sh and testosterone could otherwise suppress immunity. This, as you can see, this is kind of a, a long explanation, but none, nonetheless, that if, if testosterone could potentially suppress immunity, um, but women are preferring a partner who seems like he turned out okay and he's showing these very um, dominant features and, and yet he's doing well, then maybe he has genes that would be particularly favorable to pass on to offspring. Um, now that idea and that facial masculinity in particular might be the cue that, that females are tracking that is pushing around their sexual desires depending on where they are in their cycle. That's been, I'm pretty satisfied with the idea that women don't prefer more masculine faces at high as compared with low fertility. So there were initially some research findings that showed that that might be the case. And one of the research findings actually got us thinking really hard about connections between hormones and women's sexuality, whereas we'd kind of written that off before that research was done. But it's been scrutinized and people have attempted to replicate those findings and they don't replicate well. So much to such an extent that I think we can probably rule out that women prefer more masculine faces at high as compared with low fertility. Now that doesn't mean that all of the other sexuality effects have disappeared as well. That is a, a que that, so the hypothesis is about that particular male trait. And in that case, I think we have falsified it or at least come pr pretty close. It's, it's hard for me to use the term um, falsification in the same way that it's hard for me to use the term prove. Because there's always a possibility, and as scientists, I think we have to keep our minds open to the possibility that even if I thought it was falsified, there's more evidence that comes to light, and then I'm like, okay, well, I have to reconsider that. And so it's a dynamic thing where you're constantly considering, you know, what, are the, what is the evidence in, in favor of this? What's the evidence against it? But there are definitely, there are definitely, um, the hypotheses are articulated at such a level that you could come up with evidence that would contradict the hypothesis. So they are falsifiable in that way. So as we're oh, about three minutes left, I wanted to know if you had anything specifically that you wanted to talk about. Oh, I, I had a couple questions here mm -hmm. that I was thinking about asking you, but there's yeah. there anything that you are really have a burning desire to talk about that you haven't had a chance to talk about yet? Oh, well, we've talked about a lot, I think. So many things. Yes. Um, I, hmm. I think that, so a lot of the work that, that I talk about in the book um, concerns women's sexuality and concerns our ovulation cycles. But I think that there are incredibly interesting avenues to pursue with respect to things like what happens in the postpartum period. So when our, we're no longer in mommy mind mode where we've changed over into, I'm sorry, no, no longer in mating mind mode, but we've changed over into a mommy mind kind of way of being, and those things might um, be hormonally mediated. So breastfeeding, this is something that we've began to study in my lab. One of my um, postdoctoral research scholars in my lab, Jennifer Hahn Holbrook, has done some really amazing research along these lines. But breastfeeding, the hormones that are associated with breastfeeding are linked with parenting in some fascinating ways, but they are as yet underexplored. Um, so I, I'd say that, that that's one thing that I think it's a call for um, focus not only on changes across the ovulation cycle, but also looking at the, the hormones, hormones as they guide us through the many challenges of lives throughout our entire lifespan. Yeah, and one last question I've had from a couple people is about same-sex sexual attraction. So mm. obviously we've mm -hmm. been talking about heterosexual sure. relationships. Is there some evolutionary context for same-sex sexual attraction? This is also a very common criticism mm -hmm. of evolutionary psychology, right. yeah. Yes. Oh, um, and can so, you answer that in 60 seconds, please? Right, I know. <laughs> this is a fascinating puzzle. So why is it that somebody, you know, given the, the importance of reproduction, it's, you know, all about making babies in some sense from an evolutionary perspective. So why would we choose a partner, feel particularly attracted to a partner with whom we can't reproduce, at least not using the kinds of means that were available to our ancestors? Big, super interesting uh, question. It's an evolutionary mystery. I think there are some contenders, uh, hypothesis contenders out there. I think that the explanations are going to differ for male and female, um, non-heterosexual attractions, but to be continued on that. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for yeah, talking to us today. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> For your great question. Thanks, Hi, everybody. Just a quick reminder, Marty will be signing